morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. And all the others who are still straggling in. Hurry up, hurry up. There's lots of stuff to do and watch. So Julia herself doesn't need much, well, the Gruffalo doesn't need much introduction to all of you. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce Julia and Malcolm Donaldson and Daryl Shoot, who has converted the Gruffalo onto something that you get to see on screen. And that's the journey that we're going to be talking about today. But before I wa get into that, I want to just bring to everybody's attention here that before someone's a writer, they're a reader. And this is for all the children and the parents that Julia started out as a children's songwriter. But before she was a children's songwriter, she used to love poetry. When she was five years old, she had a birthday present from her father, which was a treasury of poems. So the stuff that we talk to our children about, those good night stories, the, the stories you tell them when they, you're trying to feed them their lunch, that stays. And where it emerges then, we don't really know. But these little interactions of affection and what we pass on to each other then enriches all of us as, as, as adults. So thank you very much for being here. I just want to begin with the question about how all of this began as writing songs for children. Um, that's right. Well, it, it didn't even begin as writing songs, but it began as singing songs for adults, actually. Singing songs for adults. Um, I, um, I studied drama and French at Bristol University, and I met this crazy medical student there. We were just good friends. And um, I was sent to Paris to, uh, to, learn, to improve my French for four months. It was very expensive living in Paris. Um, you know, we, we all the ice creams and the wine and the coffee, it all gobbled up our, our small grant. So I started um, singing in the street um, with a girlfriend, this was at first. We, I had a hat and so we would sing Blowing in the Wind and Green Sleeves, very nice dulcet songs. And then one of us would take the hat round, this would be in a cafe, and then we'd sneak into a little back lane and count out the, the money. Then we got a letter from the mad medic saying, right, I'm coming to join you with a list of all these songs. In fact, we thought we might give you a little medley, is that all right, of some of the songs that we sang in the streets in Paris? Yes, okay. definitely. Um, so to stand up. Um, must excuse my voice is a bit croaky, I've had flu. Um, so I was not singing much better than this. Um, that's a picture of us um, yes. singing. Um, we so we would sing quite a variety, like we do quite sweet things, like, um, do any of you know the musical Oliver? I'd do anything for you, dear. Anything for you means everything to me. And then we do the Beatles. Oh, I get, get by with a little help from my friends. Oh, I get, get high with a little help from my friends. We'd even do the Who, actually. We'd go, Ooh. Did we? I don't remember. We did that. I'm a Boy. You did, he did that one. I took the hat round, I thought. Yeah. Um, and then we even wrote a song in French. So if, for anyone who doesn't speak French, it's very simple. It just says, we are English, no, we, you are French, we are the mad English, we will sing for you if you will give us your money. So it went like this. Vous, vous êtes français, et nous, nous ne sommes que des anglais fous. Nous chanterons pour vous, si vous nous donnez vos sous, ba -da -ba. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, this is slightly jumping ahead, but... In Italy, we isn't it? In Italy. Yes. Oh, yeah, actually, there we, that is later. That was mm. in Italy, and we wrote a song 
about pasta and, and the chorus went like this. Yes, this is in Italian. The Italians didn't think it was funny, but they quite liked it. Lasagna, tagliatelle, 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 vermicelli. Vermicelli. Start again, start again. Lasagna, oh, tagliatelle, 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 e basta la pasta, e basta la pasta, e non ne posso più. So, <laughs> um, so I suppose what, um, yeah, what happened was when we got, I'll put my seat back again, when we, um, when we got back to England, just to our normal studies, we, we missed the performing, and so we started singing together at student dinners, student balls, and cabaret for other events, like a friend of mine's aunt was a dentist, and we sang, at, we did the entertainment for a dentist, and so I wrote a song about teeth. And so I had a lot of songs, and then I sent a tape of the songs to a children's television program, because that was, there were more songs done on children's television. So that's how I started writing songs for children's television. And one of the songs I wrote um, was based on an old Jewish, I think, folk story about a little old lady whose house is too small. She thinks her house is too small. Um, so the, I, I, I'm sure I can tell there's some good singers out there. So the chorus of this song is going to come up on the screen. So the chorus goes like this. Wise, Wise old, old man, won't, won't you help, help me, please? My, My house is a squash and a squeeze. Can we all try that? Wise old man, won't you help me, please? My house is a squash and a squeeze. Very good. And um, so this song was, was done on children's television many, many times. And... Sometimes if I was with a group of children, I used to like to act the story, the song out. And that's what we're going to do now, actually. We're, I'm going to be the little lady. Malcolm's going to be the wise old man. I think maybe we could have... Um, would you like to be the cow who dances on the table at the end? I think, I think we have the dancing cow. I think Daryl... Oh, no, perhaps not Daryl, because he's got to part later. We need... Um, Three, I do like, um, as it's meant to be an adult event, I'd like three adults to come and be the hen, the goat, and the pig. So have we got any? All right, would you like to, um, would you like to come be the hen? Um, I think we had a, I think there was a goat called Jonathan <laughs> that I met earlier on. All right, so we've got the goat. Who would like to be the pig then? Or the hog, right. Um, all right, maybe... Um, Sorry, <laughs> at the back, would you? Oh, okay. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, lovely. Then, lovely. All right. Lovely. Who is, you, you choose the piece. Yes, yeah, it's this lady. Um, so if you'd like to just come up the steps, um, there's your pig hat, uh, and there's your goat, yes. Um, so this is a little old lady's oh, table. Oh, I think that's it. Um, yeah, right, yeah. Sorry. And I think we can do this. Oh, I don't think we need to rehearse this. I think we can just launch into it. Okay. Um. This is a Calypso song. Uh. They shouldn't... Oh, well, I'm I was going to say, when I wrote it, I knew it was a folk story. I didn't know it was a Jewish folk story. And I shouldn't probably have had a pig in this story, you but so I'm sorry to any... Come up Anyone who's one. got to think about pigs. So you can write down the Sorry. Okay. You can write down. So th that's the field mm -hmm. out there, and this is the house. A little old lady lived all by herself with a table and chair and a jug on the shelf. A wise old man heard her grumble and grouse. There's not enough room in my house 
She said, wise old man, won't you help me please? My house is a squash and a squeeze. Take in your hen, said the wise old man. Take in my hen, what a curious plan. Well, the hen laid an egg on the far side rug, then flapped round the room, knocking over the jug. Oh, the little old lady cried, what, keep flapping, keep flapping, right this is the highest here. The round little the old lady cried, keep flapping just round the table. Maybe make some hen noises. <laughs> the little old lady cried, what shall I do? It was pokey for one and it's tiny for two. My nose has a tickle and there's no room to sneeze. My house is a squash and a squeeze. And, and she said, boys old man, man, won't you help me please? My house is a squash and a squeeze. Take in your goat, said the wise old man. Take in my goat, what a curious plan. Well, the goat chewed the curtains and trod on the egg. Very big stamp on the egg, I think. Then sat down and nibbled the table leg. The little old lady cried, woe is me. Was tiny for two and it's titchy for three. The hen pecks the goat, so you run away from the goat, make some noises. You can get up on your own, you can't get up. Yeah. And the goat's got fleas. My house is a squash and a squeeze. And, and she, she said, Wise old man, won't you help me, please? please. My, My house is a squash and a squeeze. Keep running, keep making your noise. Taking your pig, said the wise old man. Taking my pig, what a curious plan. Well, she took in the pig who kept chasing the hen, who's still chasing the goat. Make your noises. No, she can't. <laughs> Very good. And raising the laughter again and again. The little old lady cried, Stop, I implore it. But Titchy for three and it's teeny for four. Even, Even the, the pig, pig in the larder agrees. My house is a squash and a squeeze. And she said, wise old man, won't you help me please? My house is a squash and a squeeze. Keep, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Taking your cow, said the wise old man. Taking my cow, what a curious plan. Well, the cow took one look and charged straight at the pig. Then jumped on the table and tapped out a jig. And let's all do a dance. The little old lady cried, heaven's alive. It was teeny for four and it's weeny for five. I'm, I'm tearing my hair off and go on my, my knees. knees. My house, My house is a squash and a squeeze. And she said, wise old man, won't you help me, please? My house is a squash and a squeeze. Take them all out, said the wise old man. But then I'll be back where I first began. So she opened a window and out flew the pen. That's better. At last I can sneeze again. Choo! She shooed out the goat and she shoved out the pig. My house is beginning to feel pretty big. She huffed and she puffed and she pushed out the cow. Just look at my house. It's enormous now. Thank you, old man, for the work you have done. It was weenie for five, it's gigantic for one. There's, there's no need, need to grumble, and there's, there's no need to gross. There's plenty of room in my house, and now she's full of frolics and fiddly -dees. It isn't a squash and it isn't a squeeze. Yes, she's full of frolics and fiddly -dees. It isn't a squash or a squeeze. <sighs>
Schön. Danke, Tjerne. Welcome. So, oh, I so I forgot. Oh, okay. No, how it got made into a book. So I was just going to say, uh, many years later, a publisher approached me and they, and they made the words of my song into it. That was my first book. And that's how the story began. And now, so that was the first book. And how did it come to the Gruffalo? Um, well, it didn't come to the Gruffalo straight away. I wrote quite a lot of educational books first. Um, for, you know, it's like retellings of folk stories. And sometimes I would be asked to make folk stories into little plays. And I came across a folk story. Um, the version I read was about a little girl and a tiger. But this story exists in many, many countries. I think the original one is a Chinese story about a fox and a tiger. And I was going to turn this story into a little play for schools. And then I thought, no, I think I'll just keep it up my sleeve. And then, um, that, yeah, many years, well, a few years, a couple of years later, I thought, right, OK, I'm going to see if I can turn this story or change this story and develop it into something that could make a good children's picture book. So. So I started scribbling. I've got, I've got some pages, actually. I think these, these are some of my scribbles. So I always take a, a long time, many, many pages, um, before I get the story how I want it. So some people think Gruffalo, you know, came into my head with his purple prickles and his orange eyes and his green but not at all. I, I would just think, well, for a start, it was, wasn't going to be about Gruffalo. It was going to be about a tiger. And I was going to have a little mouse meeting a tiger. Oh, no, yes, and meeting some other animals and saying, I'm going to have tea with a tiger. And I just couldn't make it work. I couldn't get, to get it to fit in my rhyme scheme, and nothing would rhyme with tiger. So I thought, maybe I could create an, an imaginary monster, and the mouse could say, I'm going to have tea with this monster. So I said to Malcolm, would that be a good idea? And Malcolm said, no, I think I prefer the tiger. <laughs> but and I, I have never him. been allowed to forget <laughs> it. So I, then I thought, this monster, it, it could go, silly old fox, doesn't he know? There's no such thing as a mm mm O. Oh. So it had to end in O. Oh. And I thought, grrr, sounded quite good to begin. So it was going to be, silly old fox, doesn't he know? There's no such thing as a grrr, O. Oh. And I think gruffalo just sounded funny because it rhymed with buffalo. But I still didn't know what the gruffalo was going to look like. So I, I just, oh, yeah. So down the side of this book, it's actually an address book, but that, <laughs> that's got nothing to do with it, really. Um, I wrote toes, horns, sp um, spots, spots, stripes, eyes, feet, legs, tail, roar, growl, teeth, spine, spikes, warts, red, blue, yellow, green, black, any descriptive words I could think of. And then I used the ones that rhymed. But even then, it, it took me a while to get it how I wanted, because this version... His wings are orange, his tummy is black, he has spots and spikes and spines all over his back. That changed to um, his eyes are orange, his tongue is black, he has purple prickles all over his back. Um, um, then later on, um, actually perhaps we'll look at the next, look at the next one. Um, there's all sorts of stuff that didn't get into the final version. I think. Silly old fox and owl and snake. They didn't need to shiver and shake. Um, all of them really ought to know. My favorite food is gruffalo. That didn't get in. Thank goodness. It wasn't very good. And then at the end, 
I've got down there, all was quiet in the deep dark wood, the mouse found a nut and the nut was good. Delicious, he squeaked as his eyes dropped shut. My favorite food is hazelnuts. But I cut those last two lines, I thought they weren't necessary. So a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of crafting uh, went into it. version that we get to see today. So okay. that's where Axel... Axel Scheffler came. Well, Axel Scheffler, um, I should have said this probably, Axel Scheffler was chosen by the publisher to illustrate A Squash and a Squeeze. Um, so, um, and then, so he got to illustrate The Gruffalo. Um, it's a longer story than that, really, but ba that's basically what happened. And... Um, so what happens with a picture book is usually the illustrator is asked, first of all, to do some sketches of the main characters. So I've got Axel's sketches, I think. So you can see um, his little sketch there of the mouse. And I expect people can spot a few differences in how that mouse looks and what the, what the mouse at the end looks. Who can... Who, who can Say maybe one of the children in the audience can spot the difference. Yes. Oh, no, I thought it was a You're all a bit shy. Yes. Uh, yes, so, so how are they different? Um, so, in here, the mouse is very close. That is, yeah, well spotted. And have you brought us a drawing along? Yeah, my daughter made her favorite author. I think the only author she knows. So she oh. made the Gruffalo and then she wants that to give her and if she can you know sign like or to something. present you an illustration that she has oh. made of the Gruffalo. Oh, oh I and see but may, may, maybe at the end. Yeah, okay. they are wearing clothes. But I, I was just talking about this mouse here. They're not wearing clothes. Doesn't though. really look like yeah. the mouse that we ended up with in the Gruffalo. I'm sure some of you know can see that this mouse has got clothes on and the actual mouse in the Gruffalo hasn't. And um, even the fox there, he was going to have a long coat. The Axel even did some sketches of the Gruffalo with clothes. And I said, no, I, I really don't want these animals to have clothes. Um, and so Axel, I think Axel, because he's German and I think although his English is impeccable, but I think the book starts, a mouse took a stroll through the deep dark wood, a fox saw the mouse, and the mouse looked good. And maybe he, Axel, thought the mouse looked good in his lederhosen and little <laughs> check shirt, I don't know. But it was meant to be, the mouse looks good to eat. So we, we managed, the editor and I we managed to talk Axel out of that. And then he did some sketches of the Gruffalo. Um, and again, that's not quite how the Gruffalo ended up because there he looks a bit like a wicked ogre or something. Here he maybe looks too upright. He needs to be a little bit bent over a cross between a sort of stupid person and a big furry animal. Um, I think they thought that was too scary. They, the publisher likes the monsters not to be too, too terribly scary. Um, and that's important because we do love our monsters, don't we? Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> and so we also know that every monster has a soft, maybe a little bit scared side to themselves. And I've, Axel's illustrations really Yeah, I think... I think um, I think, you know, he's very clever because when the mouse first meets the Gruffalo, and that picture, Gruffalo does look very scary. And as the story goes on and the mouse is tricking the Gruffalo, the Gruffalo sort of manages to look a bit more goofy and just, you know, um, um, quite endearing in a way, yes. Yeah, yeah. You feel a little bit sort of for him. Do that, you sorry for him? Oh, yes, that, that picture. So that design. Yeah, that was what Axel wanted to be on the cover. I don't think Axel actually even wanted the shadow. Axel just, he did not want the Gruffalo to be on the cover because the Gruffalo, you, you, you're not, 
yeah, you're not supposed to know. You think the Gruffalo doesn't exist. Um, but of course, the publisher said, look, it's a book about a monster. Monsters sell books. We must have the Gruffalo on the cover. So Axel did that sketch. Even that they weren't happy. So yeah, well, actually, we can have the next one, perhaps. Although, who can spot the difference here? I'm sure you can spot another difference. Yes. Do you know what language that is in? I couldn't quite do it. German, yeah. <laughs> German. Yes. French. Um, <laughs> it, it is a European language, but it's actually actual. But you spotted language. something else. And it's been translated into how many different languages by uh, now? Um, I think it's 74, but not Hindi yet, or Bengali, so or so. Well, well. Anybody looking for any literary agents willing to do translations uh -huh. into Hindi, please? I think it's about time. Uh -huh. um, yes, so I've got a few of them. That is, I think, the Irish. Usually they begin with G. And I'm not sure how to pronounce that. the Irish. That's the um, South African. Afrikaans. Afrikaans, gruffly. Um, that certainly sounds scary. Uh, that's Finnish, Mercury. I don't know what, why he's called that in Finnish. I think that might be. A Croatian? Croatian, maybe. I'll find out. I'm going to Croatia um, later this year, so we'll find out. Um, Russia, is that Russian? That's Russian. Yeah. That's Russian. Um, that's an interesting one because it's the Hebrew. It's either Hebrew or it's Arabic. Hebrew. It's, it's Hebrew. It's Hebrew. So it, it, it works. You, you open the book the other side. And actually, even the pictures are reversed. And the mouse is traveling in the opposite direction through the book. So that's quite interesting. I think that's the last translation. Of oh, OK. That's just the, that's the final page. Yeah. And so do we get to, I think we have a treat, right? I, we I have a treat in store. Yeah, I thought we maybe could do a little performance of the Gruffalo. And we're training. actually going to see the on-stage <laughs> version <laughs> of <laughs> the Gruffalo. There, is, there are actually, there is um, a theatrical version of the Gruffalo as well, where they've got songs. But this is just, the, just my story, no, no additional material. Um, we maybe could. And I'm not in the this? cast this time. So we maybe move the um, table out of the way. So I think um, we don't. We, we shall, I'll, I'll do it with you. I'll do it. A mouse took a stroll through the deep, dark wood. A fox saw the mouse, and the mouse looked good. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Come and have lunch in my underground house. It's terribly kind of you, fox, but no, I'm going to have lunch with a, mm, a, a gruffalo. A gruffalo? What's a gruffalo? A gruffalo? Why well, didn't you know? He has terrible tusks and terrible claws and terrible teeth in his terrible jaws. Where are you meeting him? Here, by these rocks. And his favourite food is roasted fox. Roasted fox? I'm off. Fox said. <laughs> Goodbye, little mouse. And away he sped. Silly old fox, doesn't he know? There's no such thing as a gruffalo. On went the mouse through the deep, dark wood. An owl saw the mouse, and the mouse looked good. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Come and have tea in my treetop house. I, it's frightfully nice of you, owl. But no, I'm going to have tea with a gruffalo. A gruffalo? What's a Gruffalo. A gruffalo. Why didn't you know? He has knobbly knees and turned out toes and a poisonous wart at the end of his nose. Um, where are you meeting him? Here by the stream. And his favourite food is owl ice cream. Owl ice cream? 
Twit woo, goodbye, little mouse. And away Owl flew. <laughs> Silly old owl, doesn't he know there's no such thing as a gruffalo? On went the mouse through the deep, dark wood. A snake saw the mouse, and the mouse looked good. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Come for a feast in my log pile house. It's a wonderfully good of you, snake, but no, I'm having a feast with a gruffalo. A, a gruffalo? What's a gruffalo? A gruffalo. Why didn't you know? His eyes are orange, Ooh. his tongue is black, Ooh. he has purple prickles all over his back. Ooh. Where are you meeting him? Here, by this lake. And his favourite food is scrambled snake. Oh, scrambled snake? Oh, it's time I hid. Goodbye, little mouse. And away no. snake slid. <laughs> Silly old snake. Oh, doesn't he know there's no such thing as a gruffle? Oh! Terrible claws uh, and terrible teeth in his terrible jaws. He has knobbly knees uh, uh, and turned out toes and a poisonous wart at the end of his nose. His eyes are orange, his, his tongue is black. He has purple prickles all over his back. Oh, help! Oh, no, it's a gruffalo. My favorite. Food. The Gruffalo said. Your taste good on a slice of bread. Good, said the mice. Don't call me good. I'm the scariest creature in this wood. <coughs> Just walk behind me and soon you'll see everyone is afraid of me. All right, said the Gruffalo, bursting with laughter. Ha, 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 ha. You go ahead, and I'll follow after. They walked and walked, till the Gruffalo said, I hear a hiss in the leaves ahead. Oh, it's Snake, said the mouse. My Snake, hello. Snake took one look at the Gruffalo. Oh, crumbs, he said. Goodbye, little mouse. And off he slid to his log pile house. You see, said the mouse, I told you so. Amazing, said the Gruffalo. They walked some more. The Gruffalo said, Twit -twoo. I hear a hoot in the trees ahead. Oh, it's Owl, said the mouse. Well, owl, hello. Owl took one look at the Gruffalo. Oh dear, he said. Goodbye, little mouse. And off he flew to his treetop house. You see, said the mouse, I told you so. Astounding, said the Gruffalo. They walked some more till the Gruffalo said, I can hear fate on the path ahead. Oh, it, oh. It's Fox, said the mouse. Hi, guys. Have you I've seen fox? that stupid little mouse anywhere? You know, fox, I tricked by hello. before. Yes, there it is. Fox, oh, yes, hello. 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 Fox took one look at the Gruffalo. Oh, help! He said. Goodbye, little mouse! And off he ran to his underground house. Well, Gruffalo, said the mouse, you see, everyone is afraid of me. For now my tummy is beginning to rumble. And my favourite food is Gruffalo Crumble. Gruffalo Crumble! The Gruffalo said, and quick as the wind, he turned and fled. Oh! Oh! All was quiet in the deep, dark wood. The mouse... And 
a nut. And the nut was good. Thank you. <laughs> Should you bring the table? Okay, I think we're all right. Could probably move, probably move the chairs forward a bit. Shall we move them forward a little bit? Um, oh, no, let's not move the chairs. Let's not move the chairs. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, can we could move them forward a bit? No. So we've seen the Gruffalo on page, we've seen a little <coughs> bit of the version of the Gruffalo on stage, and then there's the Gruffalo on screen. And that is where we meet Daryl, who had the wonderful job of taking seven minutes of this performance and making it into a 30 minute film. Where do you get all the extra stuff from? <laughs> um, thankfully, before I started making films, I went to drama school, so that's why I'm slightly qualified to uh, <laughs> rekindle my roots uh, with, with Julia and Malcolm on stage. Um, so I, so this sort of the journey going, going backwards for, for Magic Light Pictures, the production company that I work for, started in about 2006, 2007 when uh, uh, Martin and Michael, who were the two chaps that I work with and, and own Magic Light Pictures, were reading the book to their, their children at the time. And, and Michael particularly said, I think you know, there's, there really is something in this. I think there's a, a great opportunity to, to, to develop it um, into not just a film, but to develop it into a, a brand, which is a word that I think Julia is <laughs> less, less keen on. Um, but sort of going back into that journey, exactly as, as Nupur said, you know, what we had to do was take a seven-minute story and extend it in, into a 30-minute film. And, and very much the, um, the sort of relationship and the promise and the, 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 the pitch really to Julia and Axel at the time was that we wouldn't change the story. We would keep it exactly as it, as it is. Um, and I think at the, you know, there had been lots of other approaches from various people. Yes, there had actually. Um, a few years before that, we had some people from the BBC wanted to make 36 programs, about little programs about the Gruffalo and the mouse learning to count or learning about colours. And we just didn't want that at all. And we even had a Hollywood approach to make a 90 minute film. But I didn't, I thought all they'll do is take those characters, they won't use my language, they won't use Axel's artwork. And we just hung on until we got an offer for a, a 30 minute. Um, we call it a special, a 30-minute spe television special, because that's we felt that would be the truest thing to the book. Um, and, and exactly that. So that was the sort of the, the, the promise. You know, we're, we're going to make a 30-minute animation, and it's going to be on BBC One on Christmas Day. Uh -huh. Now that was two years before, where we didn't have any money, we didn't have any cast, we didn't have, you know, we had nothing. Um, but <coughs> amazingly, we uh, <coughs> attached um, Helena Bonham Carter as the sort of lead voice, and then we got James Corden and Robbie Coltrane, and the whole project kind of started coming together. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the actual process. But, but it, it landed at, um, on uh, Christmas Day 2009, had 10 million viewers, went on to be nominated for an Oscar. We've now since then developed uh, four other titles, and we're just working on our, on our, our, our sixth film, so it, which will be Zog for this Christmas. And they're broadcast in over 180 countries ac across the world. Um, so, uh, and, uh, so we'll just watch a, a clip from the film now, so if people haven't, haven't seen it. Ooh. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Come and have lunch in my underground house. Terribly kind of you, Fox. But no. No. No, so I'm I'm going to have lunch with uh with 
Gruffalo? A gruffalo. A gruffalo? What's a gruffalo? <laughs> a gruffalo. So, so that, um, that, that process takes about two years, really, with script, script development, story, animation, uh, to, to deliver those, those finished films. But as I said, we, you know, the sort of promise to Julia really was to kind of stay as true as possible. And we spent a lot of time thinking about kind of what happens between the pages. So what does the mouse do when he's in the forest? And, and the directors, particularly um, Max Lang and, and Jacob Shu. Uh, really kind of thought about how did they used to play in the forest when they were children. So there's a great moment where the, the mouse is kind of flying through the sky on a dandelion and all of, all of those sort of funny things that we were able to add. But one thing, particularly when it came to the end of, of sort of developing this, this script and, and the moment that Jacob really had this uh, wonderful idea that all of the animals in the forest were going to come together and gather around the mouse and he was going to sit there with his nut and, and really be the, the king of the jungle. And we said to Julia... Oh. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, Jacob said to me, he, want, he wanted that, but then he wanted to show, he said, it is the mouse is not really super mouse. The mouse is still just a mouse, you know. Yeah, and so we want to end it with this party, but then you realize the mouse is just a little brown mouse. So I said, yes, you could end it like that. Or you could just end it, a mouse found a nut, and the nut was good, like in the book. And Jake Yapper said, oh, yes, yes, this is much better. This <laughs> is much better. So, so um, they, were very, um, they were very good at talking to us, to Axel and to me, all the way through the development of the story. So after two years of development, we basically just stuck with the book and, and delivered that. Except there is a framework, isn't there? There, there is, there? yes. So actually, the, the Gruffalo does have a sort of... Um, uh, mother-child relationship between squirrels to sort of intro introduce the story. But I think going forward, actually, all the films have been much more tr true to the... Yes, to the I think at first, with the Gruffalo, they thought they would need much mm. more. And in fact, when they made it, they had to cut a lot. Because if the story takes eight minutes to read, but with all the wonderful things you can have happening in the forest, every line, like the mouse took a stroll through the deep, dark wood, <laughs> can show something's happening that already is taking three times yeah. as long so I think it naturally just fills the space yeah, yeah. no absolutely um, but but the process that we went through um, was sort of quite complicated really we actually used two different styles of animation um, but the first thing to do was to bring the Gruffalo to life so it was to take those uh, 2d illustrations that Axel beautifully created with all of those those character uh, characteristics but Axel draws everything in profile so actually, there was no back to the Gruffalo. Nobody knew what he looked like when, when he turned around. So firstly, we had to create a 3D model. Mm. And that, that was the Gruffalo in his sort of 3D form. And then that character is then texturized, if we go on to. Mm -hmm. And that, again, was the first time that, that this, this sort of wonderful character had been brought to life in a 3D way. And I remember saying to Axel at the time, oh, well, you know, isn't it, it must be amazing for you to, to see your work brought together and, and be able to see the back of the Gruffalo. And he sort of went, yeah, it's okay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the journey went on, and if we click to the next... Uh, so, so the, as I sort of said, we mix these two different styles. One is kind of traditional um, stop-motion, clay, clay animation, and the, the world itself, the forest, is sort of built as a 3D set. So you can sort of see in the, in the top uh, left corner there the, uh, the, the um, sort of color keys that you develop in order to start telling, telling the story, which then leads on to this sort of set, which is kind of built in a, in a studio out of clay, bits of twig, plasticine, etc. cetera. Um, and then if you can see, there's a camera there on, on that screen, which then has a, a blue screen behind it where the clouds are effectively animated. So anything that's then... Anything that moves within that world was animated on top of it. So clouds, water, and, and obviously the, the characters as a key part of that. Because what we wanted to do was create a real textured world that you could go into and step into Axel's illustrations, but also have the fluidity of character that you get with, with CGI animation. So just on the next slide is a quick sort of demonstration of that process that you go through. There's Axel's illustrations, some of the animators' sketches, um, and then the 3D versions. 
And as well as recording the actors' performances, the animators themselves are actually incredible actors. So they will film themselves a lot of the time, and they'll, they'll develop their performances um, to, to sort of build, build out this, this world. And on to, the, on to the next. So the process, as I said, sort of takes two years. It starts, this is actually a, a, a moment from Gruffalo's Child. Um, and this is a, a, the sort of what it's called is the animatic, which is the process that you go through where you kind of build it up from, from line drawing into the kind of 3D initial model, which is sort of what you saw of the Gruffalo. So you'll see then Gruffalo's Child's actually holding a hedgehog there. So that's that sort of then the 3D world. And then onto that, you drop the, the background. So that, that is that sort, of, that sort of process that we go through. The later films we now make all in CGI because in the eight years that we've been making them, that, that technology has moved on a lot. So, uh, and the stories have become slightly more complicated. They're bigger worlds. Um, but but that, is, that is the, the, the sort of process. But beyond that, um, we then have a whole, if we skip forward, a whole licensing and merchandising program. So uh, an extensive amount of products, I think it's a uh, field. Julia gets a, a box. <laughs> every six weeks. Every so. six weeks, which she likes to rummage through and find good mm. things and sometimes not so good things. Um, but it's a, it's a really wide program in the UK. It, it launched again in 2009. Um, and uh, it's gone from, from soft toys and pajamas to, to a theme park ride. So last year uh, in the UK, we opened a, a sort of fully immersive uh, theme park attraction. Um, and you could even stay in a, hotel, in a hotel room. We were invited for the launch with our, grand, our children and grandchildren, and we stayed in Gruffalo-themed <laughs> bedrooms. <laughs> The Gruffalo hanging over the bed, which like possibly a, is Julia's worst nightmare. Like so. a sort of hunting trophy or something. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so so that, that, that is the sort of journey of the Gruffalo from, from where, it, where it started and, and where it got to. Um, and just one more slide is just some sort of visuals of how we kind of created this world. So actually what we had to do was kind of take Axel's, take Axel's illustrations and sort of tear them apart in order to create what is known as a style guide in order to, to build build the merchandise program. Um, but yeah, that, that is our, our journey. Mm. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much for that, Daryl, because I don't think we really ever get to hear about what happens behind the scenes, right from Julia's scribbles and trying to get words to rhyme and how nothing rhymes with tiger. <laughs> I never really thought of that. <laughs> and and what you really want to keep and not lose um, from the story, how uh, the film version has kept so true and actually not added any extra verbiage to the script. Mm. I think maybe Axel, the illustrator, found it more difficult than me because when I write a story, I have to hand it over to the illustrator, so I'm losing my vision, and Axel hasn't, hadn't had that experience. So, you know, the pictures in the book are his creations. And so when we hand over again to a film company, for me, it's just an, the same sort of thing. And for Axel, I think it's a little bit more difficult. Um, I, he, I mean, he sort of sees himself as outside of it as well, actually. They're not his, it's not his, he doesn't know anything about animation, so he yeah. can't, he can't. Yeah, he doesn't see them as being very close to his pictures, and yet every, all the details in the films are based on those pictures, aren't they? But, but the beauty of it is, is, I think, is that we work so closely. We always have. Yes, yes, and they've come, you know, they come on tour with us, and yeah. here's <laughs> Axel. You know, he's not just, when we go to Bombay, Axel, we're doing shows for children there, and Axel's going to be acting. Uh, uh, Daryl. Uh, sorry, Daryl, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Daryl's going to be acting a... a Thief who tries to steal a prize cow and what other parts are you doing, Daryl? A dragon in the room. A dragon, the room. yes. And the, the so it's such a lovely. Um, su they're such a nice, such just nice individuals, and it's been such a enjoyable working relationship. And there's something about merchandise, and why is it that eventually this story that means something emotionally ends up as a Gruffalo on your pajamas, <laughs> and mm. we want it. Uh, who, who wants to go to bed with a Gruffalo stuffed toy? Uh -huh. Lots of people. 
Yes. <laughs> and that's the part that's really what keeps it alive, right? Is there something about the symbolism of all of this uh -huh. um, that is an integral part of lots of children's stories? So the first line of the Gruffalo about the deep, dark wood. The deep, dark wood is everywhere, whether it's Red Riding Hood or whether it's Harry Potter and his Forbidden Forest or it's Hansel and Gretel, there's a deep, dark wood. And the symbolism of that for young people going out into the world, it's a jungle out there, are you going to be the mouse? And that small people have a lot of courage, small creatures have a lot of courage. So whether it's the mouse in the Gruffalo or whether it's Enid Blyton's characters who are solving mysteries or it's um, the hobbits, or it's Harry Potter, who was 11, and awful things happened to him. Small people have courage, and this mouse has a lot of courage. And so these themes are really emotionally important, and that's how you end up with um, a Gruffalo on your tiffin box, and uh, on your bed sheets, and a Gruffalo-themed uh, hotel. So thank you very much for joining us, and I'm going to open this out to questions. Um, small people. Yeah. Okay. Well, the brave one's right in the front. Could I say, um, because my hearing isn't very good, I may need to have the questions repeated. Um, I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi. What would you say is the hardest part of like, creating your stories, um, going through the entire process? What would you say is the hardest part of that? What was the hardest part? What would you say is the hardest part of doing the stories? Um, for me, well, in the Gruffalo itself, for me the hardest part was um, the second half of the story because it, I, I, wanted to, I didn't want it to go on and on. You know, it, it, well, after he meets the Gruffalo and he says, walk behind me, you, you know, then the story would have been... So they walked for quite a long time, and then they noticed the fox coming, the snake coming, and the snake actually was looking at the gruffalo, but the gruffalo thought the snake was looking at the mouse. And I thought, oh, no, this is going to go on and on and on, and how can I make it shorter? And I nearly gave up then. Uh, but I said, my son, who was about in his teens, our middle son, said, oh, no, Mum, I like it. Just keep, keep doing it. And eventually, I hit on the line just, they walked and walked till the Gruffalo said, I hear a hiss in the leaves ahead. And so I managed to get that into two lines. So you, you often don't realize when you're reading a, a text how much condensation you need to stop it being too, too rambling. Who's next? Um, yes. Can we get a mic to the young man, please, in um, a... Um, what did you want for the Gruffalo um, yourself to mean to um, young kids who read it, for like first time kids who read it? Do you want it to be like, what do you think it would mean? What do, would, you, do, would you want it to mean? What would you want the Gruffalo to mean to kids who are reading it for the first time. What would what, what I want the Gruffalo to, to, to mean, mean to them? To mean, to mean. yeah. What's the story, uh, what's, the, what's the message of the story, do you mean? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose like you were, like, um, Nupo, yeah, yeah, like you were saying, it is, um, you know, it's a story about brain over brawn. So it's a story about using your wits, um, that, that you can, um, if you think quickly enough, you can overcome your fears. Some people have said, you're, I'm very bad, because I've written a story saying it's okay to tell lies. <laughs> but I think it is okay to tell lies if you're trying to save your skin. <laughs> um, I also, but I suppose, really, I also want um, children and parents to slightly laugh. You know, So I think the funny lines, like scrambled snake, Owl, I scream, um, all of those add some humor. Uh, and I think also, I remember as a child hating books where 
There was too much repetition, exactly the same like. So the hen went a bit further and said to the cow, have you seen the goose? And the cow said, no. So they went a bit further. If it's exactly the same. So I, li I think I like, I hope people enjoy the slight variety pattern, but variety within the pattern. What inspired you to write this story? What inspired you, Julia, to write The Gruffalo? Well, I think I said that really. Um, it was a traditional tale about a, about a tiger was the inspiration. Uh, what, is, what exactly is a Gruffalo? Is it like a hybrid of a buffalo and some other creature? <laughs> what exactly is a Gruffalo? Is it a hybrid of a buffalo and some other creature? Um, um, it's a gruffalo. No, it's just a gruffalo. <laughs> it, the funny thing is, I wrote the story, and uh, um, about a year before it was accepted for publication, and during that time, I went into schools and I told the story of the gruffalo, and I had no pictures, and so children would draw pictures of the gruffalo. It, obviously, they were, you know, yes, he had purple prickles in all the pictures. He had orange eyes. But in some pictures, he was very tall, very, very tall. In some pictures, he looked like an alien. Um, you know, in some pictures, he looked like a robot. So he could have been anything. But I think perhaps Axel's version is a little bit like a cross between a, a, a monster and a buffalo. And I think that's important, actually, that we use these fictitious monsters because we project onto them the stuff that we are scared of, the monsters that we are afraid live inside of us. I want to be a writer, but how do I decide that I am ready for it? Oh, she wants to be a writer. Oh, do you? It's how does she know good. that? How, how does she decide that she's ready for it? Um, well, I would just keep writing, really. <laughs> just keep writing and keep reading a lot as well. Um, and uh, it is tough, you know, it's tough getting a book published. I was very lucky because um, A Squash and a Squeeze was a song, so a publisher came to me. So you'd be very fortunate that happened. You do have to develop a thick skin if you want your book to be published. The best thing is to have two stories. So you send one to a publisher, and while you're waiting for the rejection letter, probably, you send another story to another publisher. So when you get the rejection letter, one, you think, oh, maybe the other one will be accepted. So, but nowadays, of course, it's easier because you can publish stuff yourself. You can put stuff out on you know, social media, so you can still get an audience even if you don't find a publisher. So the short version of that to remember for me, having just published my first book, is A, keep writing, B, don't give up, and C, have a thick skin. <laughs> so when people say <clears throat> things to you you don't like, it sort of bounces off. Yes. There's just a question my daughter asks every time in the night when I read them the Gruffalo. They will ask me that, what do you think the mouse is clever than the fox? So what about the story of the clever fox? So what I have to tell them, the, who's the clever one, the mouse or the fox? And one more thing, when you will start writing for us, like we are waiting for our own Gruffalo, <laughs> maybe. Oh. So I didn't catch all of that. Too. So her daughter wants to know who's the more clever one? Who's, the who's cleverer, the mouse or the fox? Oh, the mouse. Mouse, because there's the conflict about the story traditionally about oh, the yes, clever yes, fox. Yes. Okay. All right. In the Chinese story, the fox is the mouse. There is no mouse. I think the Chinese story, although I never saw this story. Was it story. a girl? Sorry? Was it a little girl? Yeah, possibly. We knew a story about that. There's lots and lots of versions, not, not of the whole story. I, I'm the one who added the imaginary thing becoming real, but I think in the Chinese story, that is about a fox who 
um, tricks a uses the power of a tiger to make people respect him. So it's a slightly different message in the Chinese in the Chinese story. But the fox is not one of the predators. I'm the person. I added all these extra predators in the original story. There's no no other predators, just the tiger. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, that lady actually just also said, um, when is Julia going to start writing stories for adults? And actually, the answer to that is, you do write stories for adults. Yeah, uh, I you have write stories for everyone. Yeah, and well, that's, that's true. So that's true. But also, my book for teenagers, Running on the Cracks, is actually for ad just as much for adults. So I've got one long chapter book, um, which I think they've got on sale. <laughs> yeah. And I do write songs for adults. I still write songs for adults, and I've got some CDs of us adult songs. Okay, that's all we have time for this morning. We've got book signing and books at the back, so you could have your copies.